So, now that you know what's going on afterward, let's go ahead and bring Neil Giuliano up here. Neil has been the mayor of Tempe for 10 years, was a city council member for a four-year term prior to his election as mayor in 1994. He's the 26th mayor of Tempe and the youngest person to have been elected to the office. After the summer 2000 U.S. Supreme Court decision regarding the membership discrimination of the Boy Scouts, Neal spoke out against the city funding of the Boy Scouts through the city's United Way campaign, stating, the policy of self-selective membership requires our self-selective response with regard to the continuation of our partnership. Clearly, we cannot continue to fund an organization an organization with public funds if some members of the public are discriminated against by that organization. The religious right in Tempe launched a recall election against the mayor, and even the popular mayor could not halt the effort. With a low threshold of signatures required to force a recall, it succeeded to the ballot. The recall campaign was called what it was, an attempt to overthrow the mayor out of office for his views on a public policy issue of importance to the overall community, and was clearly based on anti-gay beliefs. It was an ugly, but an incredibly important campaign the election drew national attention and the highest number of voters in the history of the city, which included over 8,000 registered voters in Tempe who cast a ballot in the local election for the very first time. Neil won the recall election with a stunning 68% of the votes, solidifying his leadership of Tempe through 2004. In late 2002, Neil announced that he would not seek a fifth term as mayor his decade as a mayor comes to an end in July 15, 2004. On the entire recall election experience, the mayor has stated, I don't like being the only mayor in Tempe to face a recall, but in the end, the situation brought the community standing together stronger than ever against bigotry and hate. And that result was worth the entire roller coaster year of dealing with the recall. Of nearly 500,000 elected officials on all levels in the United States, only 200 only 200, 200 are openly gay and lesbian. For seven years, up until January 2003, Tempe was the largest city in the U.S. with 170,000 residents with an openly gay mayor, a distinction now held by Providence, Rhode Island, population 183,000. Neil has been a local, state, and national leader in areas of urban revitalization, human rights, and transportation. In 2003, Tempe was named an all-American city and Neil was nominated by U.S. Senator John McCain for Governing Magazine's Public Official of the Year Award. It is my great pleasure to introduce Neil Giuliano. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Mac, it's nice to finally meet you after getting all your emails all those time. I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with that. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity because it's not too often that uh, those of us who are openly gay in a lot of different fields need to interact with each other. People from the public policy sector, people from the athletic world, people from the sports and, and uh, music world, all those kinds of industries, I think it's very important for us to take that time to, to interact. So when Mac asked me to come out here, it just happened that I was on my way to New York for some business meetings and it worked out well and I appreciate the opportunity. I'll visit with you just a little bit. I will give you some notes, and I will try to give you a keynote in the sense that I know you have a very, very full program uh, for what your primary focus is here while you're at the conference. But I think it's important to share with you a little bit about leadership and a little bit about role models because you're in that position already. And I want to first thank you for being the leaders that you are. Some of you might think, well, I've never been to anything. I'm not a chair of this or that or whatever, so I may not necessarily be a leader. And I would have to contend with you that that's simply not the case. A leader is a person who influences other people to accomplish a purpose. So all of you, by that definition, are leaders. All of you have influence on a daily basis, on a regular basis, with the people that you interact with in your own world, in your own profession, you are having influence, and therefore you are a leader. Leadership is not a title. We all can think of people who have titles who are not necessarily leaders. And we also know that there are people who uh, are in situations where they don't have a title at all, and they are very much leaders within our community. 
within our world. So leadership has nothing to do with title, has nothing to do with an election. It has everything to do with the amount of influence you can have on other people to get things done, to advance a cause, to advance an issue. So this organization, all the individual organizations that you all represent, you are all deeply involved in being leaders already. My world is kind of an interesting world. You know, you, you probably, when you uh, think of an elected official, uh, the first thing that may come to mind are the very high-profile elected officials, you know, that, that prime minister or president getting off the airplane and waving and kind of coming down the jetway and so forth, or, or you see CNN and you see the tape roll of all the elected officials and so forth. And, and that's true. That's one part of leadership. I think it's too, too bad sometimes that we put our elected officials in that sort of celebrity category because we don't belong to be there at all. We're making public policy. We're trying to better conditions of our community, of our world, of our situation. And sometimes it's too bad that a lot of that gets glamorized because there's not very much, nothing very glamorous about making sure that someone comes when 911 is dialed in the community or that the water is safe when you get up and need to use it in the morning to drink or prepare to go out for the day, or that the traffic lights are working, and all those other sort of things. It's not too much glamorous about that. The opportunity comes, though, when you're involved in those public policy situations to try and make a difference beyond all of that normal sort of stuff. And when we look at how we can try in our own lives, in our own situations, to try to do something beyond all that normal stuff, therein lies the opportunity to really make a difference. So I want to offer you some thoughts about how I think you may be able to do that even more significantly than you already are. The first aspect of leadership really is your own knowledge base. And it's great that you are here. You're going to learn something from being here at this conference. Your knowledge base is key. Your charisma is great. Your smiles are wonderful. Your interpersonal skills are good. But the bottom line when it comes down to having influence over other people you're going to have to have a strong knowledge base about what it is you want to have influence about. So here at the conference, you'll take the opportunity to meet other people, topics that are going to be presented, and you'll be able to increase your knowledge base, which is extremely important for whatever it is you are trying to accomplish. The whole access to information area these days is extremely important. If you don't have knowledge in whatever your sector is, if you don't have all the information, all the knowledge that you know that you need to have, had better have access to that information in other ways. After you have that access to information, and I'm a big believer in this, it really comes down to relationships. I've seen issues of significant public policy on the federal level in, in the United States determined by relationships. That's just the way that it is. So all of the issues that we are dealing with, whether in the United States, a federal marriage amendment and defeating that before it's going to go anywhere. The reality is that we even get out of both houses of, of the United States Congress. But there's a political process, there's a game that's being played there, uh, all probably for three states in a presidential election this fall. That's just reality. That's a part of our overall dynamic. And the relationships involved with all of that are very, very key, understanding those relationships. Probably the most important part, though, of leadership and of trying to improve yourself to have greater influence has to do with your own personal development. And that's a, something that a lot of people don't really want to focus on. They want to you know, figure they can just take a class and learn something and then be a whole lot better in a particular subject. It doesn't work that way at all. Personal development is something that's incremental over time. It's identifying what we're good at. It's more importantly identifying what we're not good at and either surrounding ourselves with those people, things that we're not so good at, or learning how to be better at those. I teach a leadership development class at Arizona State University, and the students, of course, these are undergraduate students, no disrespect to any of you who may be undergraduate students in the room, but a lot of time I go, ah, I just really wish this was easier. You know, there's just so much going on, we don't have enough time. You know, the reality is, don't wish this were easier. Wish you were better and then set out the plan that you need to work on to become better so that that doesn't have to be easier for you. It's already easy because you've made yourself better to be able to respond to it. The political world is an interesting place, and we all know that there are uh, a lot of things that are challenging the political spectrum uh, in these days, all the federal issues and so forth, and the local issues. These are some actual comments that some of my colleagues have said over time. The chair would wish the members would refrain from talking about the intellectual level of other members. 
that always leads to problems. This bill goes to the very heart of the moral fiber of our human anatomy. <laughs> this bill is about saving lives, and that's good politics for us. <laughs> Before I give you the benefit of my remarks, I'd like to know what we're talking about. And this one's my favorite. Some of our friends want the provision in the bill, and some of my friends want the provision left out. And I'm here to tell you that I'm sticking with the bill. It's all the time. of role modeling is something I don't need to tell anyone in this room about, because you all are role models. We've heard some of the stories even, even last night about uh, the influence that uh, athletes can have on young athletes and so forth, especially in the, in the coming out process. I can tell you from my own experience in, in a political situation, uh, being an openly gay mayor in a city of 170,000 people, uh, the young people and the kids get it a whole lot more than the adults in the community. It's really quite fascinating. I was at an event uh, a couple of summers ago uh, for our sister city program at Tempe. We bring in probably 35 to 40 students from seven sister cities around the globe every summer. They spend six weeks in Tempe and then they spend, our, our t people, young people in Tempe go to those countries in six weeks. And it's a great program. And I was standing off to one side and I overhear some of the high school students in Tempe talking to the high school students. These Students were actually from Beaulieu-sur-Mer in France and Regensburg, Germany. And they're talking, yeah, you know, our, our mayor over there, he's, he's gay. And, uh, of course, the, the French and German kids didn't really, you know, see that that was a big deal at all. In the United States, it might, wasn't a big deal for them at all. And then they wanted to talk about all the issues that were involved and so forth. And the parents were just standing around practically in shock. This may be conversations that happen in high school all the time. They don't necessarily have a, a social event hanging around. The recall election in gave our entire community, and an entire state of Arizona, actually, a great opportunity to have a big conversation uh, about gay issues and about politics and about public policy issues and so forth. One of the uh, women that works on my neighborhood advisory commission, um, her son is actually in the Boy Scouts and involved, and she goes on some of the trips and so forth. And they were in, coming back from a trip to northern Arizona in the van, herself and another parent, who was driving, this guy was driving, she was sitting in the front side passenger seat, and six young kids, six young boys sitting in the back, coming back on this camping trip. And one of the boys said, oh yeah, I heard about that fat mayor. Well, just that comment forced, for the next hour and a half, a whole conversation heading back down from the mountains back to Tempe with these six kids, and this woman, who's a very bright and, and very progressive woman, a conversation with these six boys about, you know, the word fag and what do you know about the mayor, and where did you hear that and so forth. And she said the other guy, the other adult, just kept driving and just didn't even want to engage. <laughs> the kids get it a whole lot more. And that's why it's so important that we're taking the time to be the active role models that we can. The recall election in Tennessee was probably one of the ugliest things that ever happened in the community and it was not very fun personally as well. But I can also tell you for the community and personally, it's one of the best things that ever happened. I, uh, when I made the comments that I made about the Boy Scouts and the city's funding the United Way, it happened to be just a couple of days before I had to leave on a sister city trip to China. So I got on a plane and went to China. When I got back, I had 362 emails in my in-basket. 350 of those were saying, you ought to be thrown out of office, and we're going to do everything we can to throw you out of office. A few of them were just sort of neutral. A couple of them were saying, go get them. But there was one email in my in-basket that was the most significant of all of those. It was a semester I was teaching the leadership class at HU. And I limit the enrollment of the class to about 15. And one of the seniors in the class uh, sent me an email while I was gone. He said, I know I called your office, heard that you're out of town, but I needed to send you this right away. And I hope you'll get this right away. I left a message at the office. You know my 17-year-old brother came to Arizona State, too. He's a freshman. And we really need to talk to you. Ronnie is gay, and he tried to kill himself last weekend while you were in China. My parents are flying in. Then they're going back to upstate New York. We really don't know how to deal with this situation. Fortunately, the young man is now doing fine and, and doing well and so forth. Um, but what it taught me was, 
here in an in-basket of 300 and some emails saying, as an openly gay mayor, we don't want you anymore. We don't want an openly gay mayor. That one email, and, and the email that gave me the opportunity to uh, learn a whole lot about this young man and about the situations he had been dealing with, that one email, knowing that that kid in my class could send that kind of an email to me and put him in touch and his parents in touch with the PFLAG organization, in upstate New York and, and able to get them into counseling right away and, and help him move out of the residence hall right away and so forth because the, the policy is that student attempts suicide. They, uh, they're not allowed to stay in the residence hall more because of what other students are thinking rather than for that student themselves. That gave me the opportunity to have the most important and the most significant impact of, uh, as a role model, as a, the opportunity to impact someone's life, and as the opportunity to really to sit with those parents later on in the week uh, before they went back to New York and talk to them about their son, and talk to them about where he may be at and how they can work through this. And, and what's most important is that they are a family and that their family needs to stay together and, and they need to be there for him. Those are the kind of opportunities that may be an extreme opportunity, but those are the kind of opportunities that all of us have all the time if we're able to be honest, if we're able to be open, if we're able to be out for the, with the people that are around us in our world. So it's very, very important, I believe, that you do that. It's very important that you maintain your visibility, that you enhance your visibility, and you do what you can to improve that opportunity you have to be that kind of a role model. I make it a point on my schedule as the mayor in Tempe to visit a, an elementary school, a middle school, or a high school uh, at least once or twice a month. I don't do that necessarily because I, you know, it's a lot of fun going to talk to little kids saying, do you live in the White House? And you know, like, do you have a limousine? And things like that from the elementary kids. They're really cute, but you know, it's probably not the most effective use of your time. Um, but I do that because those kids go home. And what happens around the, the kitchen table when the kids get home? What did you do in school today? And they say, well, the mayor came and he gave me this pencil. And it just so happens the pencil are these really neatly colored rainbow type pencils. <laughs> but it doesn't say anything on them. And so I got this really cool pencil from the mayor. And I can't tell you the number of parents who have come to me later on over the 10 years and said, yeah, you know, we, uh, my kid brought home your pencil. <laughs> I said, oh, great. Did he, is he using it? And of course they're using them, and, and it's been an opportunity for the whole community to have a, a dialogue about issues of sexual orientation and to realize that, you know what, it doesn't matter whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, transgendered, whatever the situation may be, uh, you have the opportunity to have influence, so therefore you are going to be a leader. You have the opportunity to improve yourself over a continuum of personal development over time, and we all want the same things in life. We all want to be happy. We all want to be loved. We all want to have the opportunity to make a difference in some way. And that's what it's really all about. So I really commend all of you for being the, the out people that you are in the world of sports. The world of sports really is, I think, sort of the last frontier with regard to people being uh, able to be really out and really open um, in, in that world. And you all know a whole lot more about that than I do. I can tell you from my own experience, though, the professional athletes that I know from some of the teams that are in Arizona, professional athletes who are friends of mine, collegiate athletes who are friends of mine, um, I think they understand it perhaps a lot more than we give them credit for. And I think it's a whole lot more than we give them credit for. So I think we're making some improvements and we're making some progress in that area. Um, but it will be to you and to all of you in the world of sports uh, to help us push that envelope a little more. And that's not going to be easy. It's not always going to be comfortable. One of the most important things about leadership and trying to have influence is that you have to learn to live with your discomfort. I didn't know how to be the mayor the first year or so after I was elected. Anything you get into is going to be uncomfortable for a while. And if you can be comfortable being uncomfortable and learn to live that way and accept that and be successful and be effective while you're still a little, little level of discomfort, then you will graduate and move on and on to where very few things will put you in a situation where you would be uncomfortable. Let me just close with some thoughts that uh, someone shared with me a while back. And uh, you know, there's, there's such great words that uh, I use them as often as I can because it sums it up so much better than I ever could. A woman wrote the following. She said, before, 
becoming involved was something that would happen later, after I knew about myself. But they said, get involved, do something for someone else. You get this good feeling inside if you'll just do something for someone else. But I wasn't sure that that would make a whole lot of sense. Then I thought about it, and I thought, gee, if I do, it will take risk. I might fail. And at times, my soul screamed, I don't have the time to care about all of this stuff that all these people want me to be involved in. I need to be me. But I never had the courage to say that out loud. So now, I can't stop. I'm committed. Someone, somewhere is depending on me, and I'm in love with humanity. And as I look back and think about it, I laugh, but I also cry and wonder. They never told me in the beginning that I would be a bigger person. So, on my opportunity to stop here in Boston on the way to New York, my main keynote for you is you are bigger people. You are bigger people for doing what you're doing, for being out, for being honest in a world that it's difficult to be out and honest in. You're bigger people for taking the time to get engaged in this organization and other organizations where you're from at home that are clearly having influence and therefore are organizations of leaders within your own communities. And on behalf of a whole lot of people from all over the place, I really commend you and I really thank you. And have a great weekend in Boston.